Good morning. Good morning. So thank you everybody for coming this morning. Um, those online and everybody that is here and those that will watch later. For anybody, uh, I'm student pastor Carrie from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, so thank you for having me this morning and, and I'll be here, I guess, until May, unless you all tell me otherwise. <laughs> but this morning that we begin our Advent series, it's titled Your Hope is Real. So in the next four weeks, we'll be filled with joy and expectancy and hope while we wait for our Savior to be born. So we celebrate this event called Christmas, but first we have to wait. And we're accustomed to waiting. We wait in supermarket lines. We wait on the, the phone for the next available representative. We wait for the delivery driver. And we wait sometimes for food to be delivered as well to our houses. So we're used to spending a lot of time waiting. But the most important thing of all we're waiting for Jesus Christ to return for us. So there's plenty of real hope that we'll receive in Christ as we trust while we're waiting for the joyous birth of our Savior. So let us start this morning. I believe there's some announcements that I actually remembered. I didn't remember at 8.30. So who, who wants to go first? Pastor Jim, Crystal? On December 12th, we're going to have a Christmas luncheon here at the church right after um, our service at 10 o'clock. So I am inviting everyone to attend. There is a sign-up sheet in the back. Um, it is going to be potluck style, so you can sign up to bring a main dish, a side dish, or a dessert. And we are also going to have um, Christmas cookie, cookie decorating that same day. So please join us December 12th right after church. Thank you, Crystal. Um, I just wanted to make an announcement about this document. This is our church newsletter. And I've just recently found out that a lot of our church family does not even know we publish a church newsletter once every quarter. It only comes out once every three months. So, but our church secretary spends a lot of time and effort and energy in this newsletter. The graphics are spectacular. Um, there's a listing of birthdays and anniversaries on the back. There are the upcoming events inside. And then she found this little graphic of this bald guy standing at the pulpit that I guess is supposed to be me. He has glasses too, it does look like me. Um, but anyway, I write an article every, every, every newsletter that's on the first page. So. Please check that out. There are copies, there are printed copies, a limited number in the back of the sanctuary. But this also is on our website. And I think she sends this out by email, if I'm not mistaken, when it first comes out. So, so check out the link every quarter. Great, thank you. Are there any other announcements this morning? No, but um, if anybody is interested in being part of our shoveling team, um, Pat and Ken Schulteis were good enough to come down this morning and help out, but we've got a group text and basically whenever it snows, we'll send out a text. Anybody that's available can come down. Great exercise, great way to start your Sunday morning. God seems to have it snow Saturday nights quite a bit for some reason, but... Um, just if you're interested, let any of, uh, let any of us know and we'll uh, put you on the list. Thanks. Okay, very important. So let us now turn our hearts and minds to God and Jesus as we begin with a call to worship. Good morning. I believe it's responsive behind me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. We patiently await the birth of his son. The world will be saved through Jesus Christ. We live in a dark, sinful world. The light will come into the world. Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light.
So we will light the Advent candle, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we watch and wait for Christ's coming. We light the candles of hope, peace, joy, and love, remembering the promises of God with prayer. I invite the Pasconelli family to please come up and light the candle, please. We, we light this candle in hope. Prayerfully consider the hope God brings to the world through Jesus and the hope we have in his promised return. Listen to these words from prophet Isaiah chapter 9 verses 2, 3, and 6. Verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let us pray. Faithful God, out of death you bring your life. Renew us in hope that we may be alert to the coming of Christ's advent among us. God of promise, God of hope, into our darkness come. Amen. Please stand if you are able to sing our opening hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Please be seated. We are all adopted into the family of Christ. Please turn to your brother or sister in Christ and pass the peace of Christ by placing your hand over your heart, wave, or show them the peace sign. May the peace of Jesus Christ bring light into this world. Our call to confession. Our hope in Jesus Christ is real. Jesus was born into a sinful world for our benefit. We bring our confession of sins to God, knowing God hears and forgives us as we repent of our sins. Let us join together in the unison prayer of confession. 
Merciful God, always with us, always coming, we confess that we do not know how to prepare for your advent. We have forgotten how to hope in miracles. We have ignored the promise of your kingdom. We get distracted by all the busyness of this season. Forgive us, God. Grant us the simple wonder of the shepherds, the intelligent courage of the magi, and the patient faith of Mary and Joseph, that we may journey with them to Bethlehem and find the good news of a child born for us. Now, in the quiet of our hearts, we ask you to make us ready for his coming. Amen. And our assurance of forgiveness. God loved us so much that he sent his only son to die for our sins. We are forgiven through Jesus Christ. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call you. We are forgiven. time for Kids Rock with Mr. Pasquinelli, Mr. Helenda. Our prayer for illumination. Make us to know your ways, O Lord. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation. For you we wait all day long. Amen. And our Old Testament reading today is from Psalm 37, verses 1 through 7. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Advent is a season of waiting and joyful expectation. So the Advent wreath candles that we lit are a reminder of this. And during this time, I think of Mary. And she carried Jesus in her womb when she went to visit Elizabeth, who was also expecting her baby John the, the Baptist, leaped in Elizabeth's womb. Elizabeth exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. So these are dangerous times for Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, but God was with them. God's plan to send his only son into the world was set into motion. Mary believed and trusted in the Lord and the baby, and she believed that the baby she was carrying is the hope for the world. Jesus is a real hope for us today. Now, as someone that has not birthed any children, I'm not sure what Mary or Elizabeth was feeling. My stepdaughter, Amanda, she told me stories of morning sickness and a whole lot of uncomfortableness when she was pregnant with Racer. But she was also thrilled and grateful that she was going to bring a child, her son, into the world. 
So imagine the humbleness that Mary must have felt to be chosen to deliver God's only son into the world. And probably all of us have experienced waiting for something that we're looking very much forward to. For me, I was on a waiting list for a West Highland White Terrier puppy. And um, I was excited when I got the call from the breeder that a litter had been born and I could pick one. So I picked a little girl puppy and I waited eight long weeks getting pictures every week of my little puppy as she was growing up and I named her Zoe. And Zoe in Greek means life. So these next few weeks in Advent are filled with hope and joyful expectancy for the birth of a baby named Jesus. We trust in God for this perfect timing that this baby born so long ago brings life anew to us now. And we patiently wait in this sinful world for Jesus to return for us. Our scripture reading this morning from the New Testament speaks of the hope that we receive not only during Advent, but all year long. So let us hear God's word for us this morning. And this is from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Tom Petty, he sings that the waiting is the hardest part. Every day you get one more yard, you take it on faith, you take it to the heart, but the waiting is the hardest part. Probably that's true for many of us. Waiting is difficult. Paul starts his letter to the, the Christians in Rome that we wait patiently, he writes in the letter. What we're waiting on is the hope that the creation will be set free of sin. And we know that Jesus' return is the way that we will be set free. We trust in God while we're waiting as God's plan is unfolding. We may not see all the ways that God is working in us. He's protecting us and guiding us. And last week for the children's message, we talked a little bit about King David. So we're going to talk a little bit more about King David as he placed his hope and trust in God. So David was anointed king while Saul was still in this role. So you can see how that would be challenging for David. Many of us probably are, are familiar with this story. Samuel was sent to Bethlehem to anoint the next king because God rejected Saul. So the next king would be a son of Jesse. So Samuel visited Jesse and all the sons had passed before Samuel, but none were chosen. So Samuel asked a question to Jesse, do you have another son? Jesse said, yes, there's one more out in the fields with the sheep. So David was brought in from the pastor and the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. Samuel anointed David in front of his family, including the brothers that were not selected. And verse 13 in, in that scripture tells us the important part of David's long 15 years of waiting to be crowned that the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. So David trusted in the Lord to protect and guide him. And throughout many attempts by King Saul to kill David, the spirit of God hindered each attempt. Saul told his son Jonathan that if David lives, Jonathan would not be established as the next king. So Jonathan did something unexpected 
and he protected David. Jonathan told David not to be afraid and that his dad would not harm him. So Jonathan told David in 1 Samuel 23, verse 17, that you will be king over Israel and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. And David had the opportunity to kill Saul, but he did not. He did cut a corner of Saul's robe off, though. So the scripture tells us that David respected Saul because God had anointed Saul over Israel. It was not David's time to be in the leadership role. David never lost hope and trusted God at every moment of waiting. He proclaimed in Psalm 37 to trust in the Lord and commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in him. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. We heard these verses in the Old Testament reading just a little bit ago. David lived by these words. So when King Saul died, David became his reign over king of Israel. We find in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 4 points out that David was 30 years old when he became king. We also know Jesus was also 30 when he began his ministry. So even Jesus had to patiently wait to trust and trust in God's perfect timing when to start his ministry. Jesus entered in the family business of carpentry. But God's plan for Jesus was, and still is, to be our hope, leading us and teaching us. And Jesus died for us for our, our salvation. God formed and knew Jesus before he was born. From Jesus' birth until his death, and even now, God planned every minute of his son's life. God also cares for us and knows our course. God plans our lives as well from the day we were formed in the womb. He directs our steps each day. We may not know where we are on God's roadmap, but we can certainly ask for directions. And we trust in God's plan and God's timing for us. In the beginning of Romans, Paul opens up the letter to the Christians telling us of God's promise in the Holy Scripture regarding his son, who was a human nature, was descend, a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God. If David had not trusted God, the story of Jesus would be quite different. The spirit of God was with David and is also with Jesus in power. Their leadership styles are vastly different. David's a warrior, and he conquered many people. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, who teaches and saves many people. The hope of our world would have been altered if Mary and Joseph had not trusted in the Lord. Mary believed the baby she was carrying is the Messiah. Joseph listened to the angel in his dream to not cast Mary away and marry her as planned. These are crucial parts of the Christmas story. Changing one of, one of those parts in history would have changed the magnificent birth of Jesus Christ as it is written. It was God's plan that Jesus would be born to Mary and Joseph, descendant of David, in a lowly stable in Bethlehem so many years ago. And that is what we await to rejoice. And we know the events that ensued after Jesus' birth. The shepherds heard the good news from the angels that a savior was born, and they went to find him, laying in a manger. And they announced the good news that our savior had been born to everyone that they encountered. The wise men were wise enough to not listen to Herod. They listened to the dream to not go back to Herod with the location of baby Jesus. King Herod declared an edict that all male children under two shall be killed in Bethlehem. When the angel of the Lord went to Joseph in a dream, they moved safely to Egypt. He took Mary and Jesus with him. So all these happened because they trusted in the Lord. While we patiently wait to celebrate the birth of our Savior, we also know Jesus died for our sins. Our scripture speaks of, of the hope and reconciliation when Jesus returns for us. Creation will return to the splendor it was before sin entered our world. The one thing that we do know 
is that we don't know when that will be. People have tried to predict when Jesus will come back for us. They've used different methods and models and numbers and ways to figure it out. Harold Camping was one of them. He gave us at least 12 different predictions. The most recent one was May 11th of 2011. Oh wait, no, he actually meant October 21st of 2011. Nonetheless, he was wrong, as well as many of the other ones were also wrong. Only God knows when Jesus will return for us. And maybe Duke, the dog from the Bush's Baked Beans commercial, because he's not talking. Our scripture does talk to us, and in the New Revised Standard Version, it titles this passage as Future Glory. So to this point, we've discussed Jesus' glorious second coming. However, there are several verses that focus on suffering while we wait. So who wants to suffer? Show of hands. Okay, let's not all line up at once. So everything that we go through, Jesus went through as well. Jesus knows a thing or two about suffering. So verse 18 declares that the suffering of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed in us. Pastor Rick Warren says in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, that it is during suffering that we learn to pray our most authentic, heartfelt, honest-to-God prayers. And he also says that God is going through the pain with us. We do not serve a distant and detached God. Instead, he enters into our suffering. Jesus did it in the incarnation, and his spirit does it in us now. God will never leave us on our own. Well, that's good news. God wants to be in constant communication with us, even when we are suffering. We don't go through anything in our life alone. And when we read further in Paul's letter, He's declaring that all of God's creation will be redeemed. That's great news as well. We've been pretty hard on Mother Earth. So one commentary says that this passage therefore contains the promise that God will restore his violated creation to its original goodness. Yet because the promise of that restoration remains for the moment just that promise, we have it only in hope. To be sure, that hope is already the beginning of our salvation but it remains at present no more than a beginning, a fact which requires of us yet some patience. So being patient is hard work, but the hope that we will receive in Jesus' second coming is unmeasurably great. So we know a little bit about this hope Paul is writing about to the Christians in Rome. We have God in our hearts. And the Holy Spirit gives us insight to our future. Verse 18 clearly points out that the glory will be re revealed in us. So not to us, not near us, or by us, but in us. So when the glory is revealed in us, we will be like the exalted sun, and it will also transform the world of nature, as another commentary explains. Suffering is necessary to achieve the glory of the hope revealed in us. Paul describes his suffering in chapter 5, also in Romans, writing that we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So as we prepare our hearts and minds for the next several weeks of Advent, let us not forget that the hope that Jesus brings us. We receive this hope while trusting God as we suffer in this sinful world. Many of us will be decorating for Christmas soon, and the church will be decorating after this service, so please stay if you're able. And if you're like my stepdaughter, you've had your tree up since the day after Halloween. So the, the decorations are beautiful, and they remind us of the beauty of the birth of our Savior. It's easy to get caught up in all the buying and spending to get the perfect gifts. But our perfect gift of hope will return to us when God deems it is time. Until then, we patiently wait for Jesus. So I'd like to offer this prayer that's found in a Christmas card from the Villa Maria, Sisters of the Humility of Mary. And the card reads, In the Christ child, God becomes physical. 
On behalf of our community, I pray that you will discover anew the presence of God in physical exchanges of affection that are only possible because Christ embraced humanity. So let us be patient as we wait for the joyous birth of our Savior. Our hope is real, and it begins with trusting God. Amen. And as we move into our joys and concerns, so let us pray for anything that is on our hearts this morning, for people and places. Some of, some of our morning ones were um, the prayers for John, John Peterman, who was in the hospital. So we'll pray for him. And also this morning, we prayed for the children in other countries who are suffering, um, countries like Afghanistan. And we prayed for our Operation Christmas and for our family that we are, we'll give gifts for. Are there any other joys and concerns? That was the one I forgot this morning. All right, let us begin with prayer. So God sent us hope in his only son. Jesus Christ was born a humanly birth on earth. Jesus' humble birth and promise that Jesus will return for us is hope indeed. We humbly bring forth our prayer requests. God hears our joys and concerns, spoken or unspoken. We trust God to respond to our prayers in God's timing. We're not only patiently waiting to celebrate Jesus' birth and a second coming, but also for healing of those in need. We trust we will be, we will be healed, whether in the kingdom of heaven or here on earth. So while we're on earth, we pray for healing as we wait for our eternal home. This morning, we pray especially for John Peterman, who's in the hospital. We pray for the doctors and nurses, staff, as they care for him. And we pray for Karen and his family as they are by, by him. We pray for children around the world who don't have the same freedoms as we do, who are in fear, fear of war, fear of many, many things that are unpleasant whether they're in Afghanistan or wherever they reside in our, in our world, even here in the United States, we pray for our children who are experiencing hardships. We pray for our ministry for Operation Christmas and for the family that will receive gifts this year. We celebrate a joy of Pastor Jim's birthday. And we pray for Matt as he goes into surgery soon for his knee. We pray for Michelle, and we pray for the doctors and nurses that will be caring for him. And we pray for a speedy recovery that will be back in worship in no time. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray, saying these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And this morning, our affirmation of faith is from the, the brief statement of faith, verses 1 through 18. We could say those together. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one true God, the Holy One of Israel, who alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, holy human, holy God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed, blessing the children, healing the sick, tending the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. This morning we bring our offerings to God. So in our time together this morning, we've talked about receiving hope. So our offering is where we can give hope to others through the talents and tithes that we share. So we may be familiar with the shopping days after Thanksgiving. So Black Friday and yesterday was Small Business Saturday. Tomorrow's Cyber Monday. So in a global response to all this spending, Giving Tuesday was established, which is the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. So coming up in a couple days. Forrest Palmer, he's a retired presbyter of the Presbyter Presbytery of West Virginia. He uses the scripture of Matthew 25 to remind us that we are called to serve our Lord in addressing poverty, hunger, and racism, which helps us become a more vital and faithful church. So our offering of gifts today and every day helps those in need here in our church and in our community. So let us dedicate our offerings this morning with this prayer. Dear God, please use our offerings dedicated to your holy work as we trust in your timing. We receive hope while waiting for your son's birth during Advent. We pray our gifts will glorify your name and help others in need during this Christmas season of giving and receiving hope. Amen. So let us sing our closing hymn. If you're able to stand, please do so. And we'll sing, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. perfect timing of his plan for Jesus's return for us. Blessings as we begin Advent and waiting for the birth of our newborn Savior. Please, peace be with you in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit.